Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you very much, Dr. Castaneda and his team for kindly organizing and hosting today's event. And the title of my talk is um, Friedrich August von Hayek's Denationalization of Money, Some Critical Remarks. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of our session is basically to give you an insight. What is this book all about? And then also some critical remarks, I think, are in order to um, deal with certain proposals Hayek made in his important, very important book, I should say. And um, when I read The Denationalization of Money many, many years ago, I have to confess I wasn't really convinced. I thought it would be off the mark. Back then, I was kind of, I guess, mainstream economist who was thinking you need a central bank and you need a monopoly of money production and a free market in money, as Hayek envisaged, simply cannot work. And I put that aside, but over the years, and this is what I uh, love to convey to you, is uh, you learn more, you think more about things, and you come to different conclusions. And uh, still, I think it is a very important book for students to read and to think about. And it has also very practical uh, implications. Some of you might be big fans of crypto units, such as Bitcoin. And in these, uh, in these circles of uh, crypto unit uh, people, Hayek's writings, especially uh, denationalization of money, is, is very popular. So it makes a lot of sense to at least uh, get into contact with this book. Um, Friedrich August von Hayek, Dr. Castaneda said it already, was born in 1899 in Vienna. And uh, he is still, I would say, one of the most prominent representatives of the so-called Austrian School of Economics. The Austrian School of Economics, I should say, is not an homogenous uh, school of thinking. It's actually quite diverse once you delve into the various writings of its representatives. Hayek certainly is the most prominent representative of the Austrian school. As I said, in 1974, he was awarded the Nobel Pri uh, Prize of Economics together with the Swedish economist Gunnar Myrdal. And that is, of course, uh, or it was an event that brought him on the world's, uh, well, brought him the world's attention because being awarded with a Nobel Prize, you know, comes with lots of prestige. And that helped, of course, all the other uh, Austrian uh, scholars um, that Hayek was uh, rising to such a prominent status. Uh, in a nutshell, Hayek, in uh, his uh, denationalization of money, calls for putting an end to the states or the governments, whatever you prefer as far as the term is concerned, uh, to put an end to the state's monopoly of money production, replacing it by a free market in money. And as I said, at first glance, it seems to be a rather radical proposal, isn't it? At a second glance, however, uh, we would realize that there is actually strong economic and ethical uh, support for Hayek's idea. And I should add that Hayek uh, is and was not alone. Quite a few economists over the years have challenged and even opposed uh, the status quo, namely that money production is monopolized by the state. For instance, in Europe, in the Eurozone, uh, the European Central Bank is the monopolist of money production. It is the only institution that has the license to produce central bank money. And, this, and central bank money is required by all commercial or private banks to create their own type of money, namely commercial bank money. On on the first slide, I, I brought with me, let me see. Yeah, I, you find some, some literature, just in case you find some of the ideas we will address of interest. Uh, so you have a list of, I think, worthwhile readings. 
um, Hayek's uh, denationalization of money, the argument refined. Um, that's the book we talk about, and Dr. Castaneda referred to the precursor of that book, uh, Choice of Currency, A Way to Stop Inflation uh, from 1976. Um, also of interest is the reading in uh, Mises' Human Action. Ludwig von Mises was basically uh, the supervisor of Hayek in, in Austria and a uh, close friend. And then, of course, the writings uh, uh, by Rothbard, uh, especially uh, his 1995 uh, essay, three-part essay, How to Free from Government Money. You find that on the website. And when it comes to free banking, because free banking is associated with the idea of having a free market in money, I would like to refer you to Sequest's book from 1993, uh, Free Banking Theory, History and Less Affair and a laissez-faire model. And you find that on the internet, I think you can download uh, all the literature for free. In his uh, denationalization of money, Hayek proposes to give uh, people, and I think this is what it boils down to, the freedom of choice in money affairs. You and I, we all should be free to choose the kind of money we think is best for our purposes. And at the same time, people should be free to provide their fellow people with things they voluntarily wish to use as money. I think this is the core idea uh, as Hayek outlines it in his denationalization of money. Hayek <coughs> rejects the monetary status quo. Just to remind you, I already referred to that today, the world over we find state-controlled monetary system systems, uh, state-owned central banks, hold the monopoly of the production of money or the production of central bank money and private commercial banks have received so-called uh, a license, a license uh, so to speak, allowing them to produce their own type of money, commercial bank money. So I think we should ask several questions and I brought you five questions. So let us begin and ask the question, why does Hayek come up with his proposal to end state monop money, pro uh, money production monopolies, replace it with a free market in money? Well, when Hayek published his book uh, in the 1970s, goods price inflation was very, very high in the Western world. Uh, in the US, they were talking about the great inflation. They had consumer price inflation of up to, what was it, 16, 18 percent. Uh, it was, uh, in the UK, it was, I think, slightly worse. Uh, inflation was, was exactly, was, um, was even higher. And um, where did it come from? Well, the US administration had ended uh, the gold redeemability of the US dollar on the 15th of August 1971. Before that uh, day, the US dollar was basically linked to gold. 35 US dollar were equivalent to one on ounce of gold, so 31.1 uh, grams uh, of uh, physical gold. And the unilateral decision on the part of the US administration to end the redeemability of the US dollar, uh, established a worldwide, what we call, fiat currency system, a system in which every currency in the world was no longer redeemable into anything. That was pretty, pretty unseen in the history of monetary affairs. And as a result, the quantity of money could be increased in any amount at any time seen politically Expedient. Many states made use of that uh, new capacity. They run enormous uh, deficits uh, financed by newly created money. And the strong increase in the quantity of money made goods prices go up. People in the US, I said it, uh, were talking about the great inflation, so bad it was. And um, so, uh, also, many other uh, European countries suffered heavily, or the people suffered. Countries don't suffer. We should always talk about people. <laughs> so people suffered from 
very high inflation. And being an economist in the tradition of the Austrian school, Hayek uh, has a special interest in monetary theory and, of course, the monetary theory of the business cycle and, uh, you know, the recurrence of boom and bust. But Hayek clearly had an idea about the bad consequences of inflation. Hayek is acutely aware of even the destructive forces set into motion by high inflation. And so it doesn't take wonder that he reacted most sensibly to the inflationary tendencies uh, of his time. Austrians typically consider inflation, and inflation has different meanings to different people. Inflation, according to mainstream economics, is basically a rise in the prices of goods and services over time. It's not just a one-off increase in prices, but a chronic increase uh, in goods prices over time. And they ascribe this phenom monetary phenomenon to the increase in the quantity of money in an economy. Also, Hayek pointed out that inflation is, inflation is very unjust. It benefits some at the expense of many others. There are always people who benefit greatly from inflationary waves. But most of the people suffer. Their currency devalues. They can buy less goods and services for their savings, for their money balances. And most importantly, inflation, according to Hayek, caused by an expansion of the fiat money quantity, leads to boom and bust cycles. It leads to booms you know, where firms start investing very heavily, uh, consumers uh, start uh, living beyond their means, and at some point this boom turns into a bust because it is not uh, sustainable. And finally, Hayek also pointed out that the issuance of fiat money helps the state or the government mm -hmm. uh, to expand at the, expand, at the expense of the freedoms and liberties of people and entrepreneurs. So Hayek, in his uh, critique of the state, state's money production monopoly, emphasizes that inflation is typically res the result of governments spending too much relative to their tax revenues and increasing the issuance of fiat money to finance the deficit. And I think that was a fair description when you look uh, to monetary history or the inflation history uh, Hayek was certainly uh, to, uh, got, it, got it right. And uh, from another publication, I brought you a very nice quote from Hayek. He uh, wrote, quote, with the exception only of the period of the gold standard, practically all governments of history have used the exclusive power to issue money to defraud and plunder the people, quote ends. So he's very specific. Uh, it's, it's not, I guess, very diplomatically put, um, <laughs> but um, I think it, it, it shows how uh, deep Hayek thought about the problems uh, that come with inflation and the causes of inflation. And uh, I think now we have an idea why Hayek calls for a, a denationalization of money. He makes a proposal to give people better or sound money compared to the money that is produced under a state monopoly. And speaking of money, it's a kind of digression what you should know about money. I mean, if I ask you what is money, most people have an idea of what money is. Some say, well, money is what money does. But uh, from an economic point of view, you may have uh, some sympathy for the definition as, as the following one. Uh, money is the, uh, is the um, uni uh, universally accepted means of exchange. Money is a good like any other good. It is at the same time the most liquid good. It is the good that can be exchanged most easily against un other vendable items. Money is the good with the highest marketability, so to speak. <laughs> Ludwig von Mises, uh, Hayek supervisor, came forward with the, with the insight, with the idea that money has just one function. In most textbooks you find money has various functions, namely means of payment function, unit of account function, and store of value function. And Mises said, well, money's sole purpose is the means of exchange function. 
all the other functions are basically derivatives of the means of exchange function. Like for instance, the store of value function just means that you postpone the act of transaction from today into the future. Now, uh, if, you, if you agree that money has just the means of exchange function, one conclusion is that it doesn't matter what the quantity of money in the economy is. It doesn't matter whether the quantity of money, for instance, in the Eurozone, is 16 billion euro, or whether it's 8 billion euro, or even just 1 billion euro. If the stock, the quantity of money is large, is high, goods prices will be relatively high. If the money supply is lower, goods prices will be relatively lower. But all transactions can be transacted with a given stock of money. Where it becomes interesting is when there is a change in the money stock in an economy. When the money stock changes over time, that has, of course, very important consequences. And here, Mises and Hayek refer to the so-called Cantillon effect. Richard Cantillon was a Irish, French economist. I think he, to my knowledge, for some reason, you may know better, he was basically the first one who came forward with with the monetary theory of the of the business cycle in the in the late 17th century. And uh, what he said was that an increase in the stock of money in an economy is never neutral. Like for instance, monetarists they would argue that an increase in the money supply in the economy sooner or later raises all prices, which is possibly true. But Hayek and Richard Cantillon, they had a more micro-oriented perspective. They would argue that if the money stock in an, econ in an economy increases, there will be winners and there will be losers. The winners are, are the ones who receive the newly created money first, the gentleman over here. If we are an economy and we're having 100 pounds and the gentleman gets an additional 100 pounds, he is the one who can spend that money for goods and services at unchanged prices. And over time, as the newly created banknote passes from hand to hand, it's used for demanding goods and services, and so the prices will tend to go higher. And Dr. Castaneda, he's the last one who receives, who receives the newly created money, can only spend the received banknote against goods and services at elevated prices. So here we have the winner of the money creation, and here we have the loser of the money creation. The increase in the change of the quantity of money is never neutral. It is always associated with changes in the distribution of income and wealth. I think this is also an important insight Hayek reflected on because in a gold, for instance, or commodity-based monetary system, the quantity of money changes, like in Spain in the 16th century when they went to South America. Typically, a commodity-based money system is characterized by the supply of money changing only gradually over time because it's very costly to dig down deep and get new uh, gold or silver up. In a fiat money system, you can create additional money balances quite easily. And so the distributive effects in a fiat money system are much more pronounced than in a commodity-based system. So I think um, Hayek was very much aware of, of these uh, implications that come with an increase in the, in, the, in the money supply in the economy. So he was very much aware of the inflationary problems, but also the more micro-oriented consequences an increase in the money supply entails. Now, let us uh, turn to the question, uh, how would a free market in money work? I guess most of you like uh, free choice, most of you. This is just a hypothesis, but most people I find, and I cannot prove that, just an empirical observation, most people like uh, free choice when buying, say, food or sports shoes, books, computers, furnitures, cars, etc. And I think it doesn't take much uh, to convince you that a free market, free choice in a free market caters best to the needs of consumers, providing them with goods of the highest quality at the lowest possible price. 
you may be asking yourself, how could a free market in money possibly work? Isn't that strange? Well, it would presumably work like this. People, when making exchanges, would preferably use that type of medium of exchange that is most widely accepted, that has the highest marketability. To give you an example, I, for instance, would seek to get hold of a medium for exchange, which is from the viewpoint of my trading partner, say a baker, shoemaker, shop owner, that is from the viewpoint of my trading partner most highly valued. And whoever it is I'm trading with would seek to hold a medium of exchange that can most easily be exchanged at the car producer and so on. In other words, in a free market in money, it is the demand for money that determines what money is. The money is not imposed on the people, but people, for practical reasons, would choose the kind of money that serves their purposes best. So you could even say it is the people in a free marketplace that determine what money is. But what about the money supply, you may ask? When seeking good or sound money, people will realize that this thing that should serve as the means of exchange must have certain characteristics. For instance, it must be scarce, homogeneous, so of the same quality and type. It must be durable, it must be mintable, it must be transportable, it must represent a relatively high value per unit of weight or whatever it is. And when you look into monetary history, you find that people mostly preferred gold and silver in particular, even copper, because from their point of view, things met the requirements of sound money in the best way. Of course, we wouldn't know if we open up a free market in money in the UK by just pressing a button, what, would, uh, what kind of money would emerge. As you know, the free market is a discovery process. And Hayek on many occasions made that point. Competition allows us to find out what works best. And that would, of course, be the same with money if we allow for a free market in money. Against the backdrop of historical experience, I could imagine that people would go for gold or silver or gold and silver. You would have a kind of bimetallism as they had in the United States after the Mint Act in 1792, or even a cryptocurrency, a crypto unit that becomes later a widely or universally accepted means of exchange. And that's basically an interpretation of how a free market in money would work. Before we explore the idea a bit further, we could argue, is opening up a free market in money, like Hayek suggested is in his book, really convincing? Is, is the concept watertight? I think it's fair to say that Hayek's study drew a lot of criticism when he stepped forward. Most economists of his time argued his concept would be unrealistic and undesirable. Among economists, Hayek's idea had indeed remained a sideshow for many years. It had been discussed and then it was put into the library and it sat there for a long time. But most recently, I already referred to that wonderful development. The people from the crypto space discovered the idea of denationalization of money and so Hayek's uh, book got a lot of attention. But on the other hand, I must say the critique was justified due to some inconsistencies which permeates his or Hayek's line of argumentation. I give you an example. When Hayek argues about the competition or denationalization of money, which means a competition of currencies, as it was put, most people think there would be chaos, you know, because if you and I, we were, all of us are allowed to <coughs> issue money, it would be monetary chaos. And uh, one could argue that Hayek confuses money proper with money substitutes. Now the idea would be that people decide what type of money they would like to use. Let's assume they decide for gold and silver. And you would call this decision or the money that emerges from this decision as money proper. But then for practical purposes, you wouldn't want to carry gold coins with you. In a free market, so-called money warehouses would offer you services like storage, payment settlement services, and you would actually place your money with a trusted money warehouse, and the money warehouse would issue in return a so-called money substitute. 
like a banknote or on your app, on your iPhone, you get an accounting device. This money substitute would then be used in day-to-day -day transactions. So the competition I is actually referring to is basically among various money warehouses competing for clients, for customers in the free marketplace, offering better services at lower fees. And so if you open up a free market in money, presumably the decision what is money proper will be made. And once that has been decided on, it will, will remain for a long time in place. So the actual competition in that idea is really this competition among various money warehouses and their and the money substitutes they, they issue. A second critique I should mention is um, the question, how is the new money created in, in Hayek's concept? Hayek gives basically two ways of production, so to speak. Um, he would think that the new money, the new type of money, would literally be printed up by someone who is a respected issuer of money. Or the alternative would be that the new money would be loaned into existence. So an accepted, trusted issuer of money would provide you with a loan and at the same time you get additional monies on your checking account. The idea that I would step forward, take a piece of paper and write my name polite on it and the number 100 would never ever make it to money because no one knows what exchange value this polite 100 note has. And in monetary history actually there is no example where unbacked paper money was put into place like this. All examples where unbacked monies developed were ending the redeemability of an outstanding banknote into the underlying commodity, like the Americans have done in 1971. So the idea that I could step forward, or even Hayek could step forward, or Dr. Castaneda could step forward and we just issue our money, this idea is in conflict with Ludwig von Mises' regression theory, where he tried to outline where does money really come from, and that is an idea that goes back to Karl Menger, who emphasized that money has emerged spontaneously out of the free market transactions and out of a commodity. And Mises basically provided a logical foundation. So one could criticize this idea of, you know, getting new money into, into circulation, as Hayek suggested, and the second line of production of new money, loaning it into existence. That causes actually trouble with Hayek's idea of the monetary business cycle theory. If you loan money into business, then you end up like in a fiat money system where you increase the money supply not backed by real savings, and then you get into this boom and bust cycle. So these two critiques I just wanted to point out, they can or they may explain why there was quite some resistance to Hayek's notion of a free market in money. Let me say that I hasten to make clear that these criticisms, there are others uh, we could address, that these criticisms refer to technicalities. They by no means imply an outright rejection of the idea of denationalizing money. It's really about smaller technicalities that can be sorted out. And I think the important point at this uh, juncture is there are still very important lessons that can be learned from Hayek's denationalization of money. I think that needs to be emphasized, especially for us today. Let me give you some lessons and then I'm going to end my talk. Hayek reminds us that there is no compelling economic and ethical reason uh, why the state or the government should hold the monopoly of money production. And in fact, that providing the state with the authority over money will lead to inflation and its economic and societal evils. I think this is a very, very important lesson. The second lesson, Hayek rightfully points out that the free market for money is possible. So he comes up with an alternative. And that is uh, no doubt about that, economically and ethically a superior alternative to today's state-controlled money monopoly regimes. And the third lesson, Hayek's free market in money can be set into motion quite easily. It can be put into practice with relatively little changes. We would need just three changes. Number one, ending the legal tender status of official currencies. That can be done quite easily. So you take away the privilege of the existing currencies in terms of their legal tender status. Second, 
ending capital gains taxes and VAT on money candidates like gold and silver or crypto units. And the third change is ending all remaining regulations that stand in the way of using other means for payments and then uh, free market in money is ready to go. It doesn't take much. And then people can decide whether they will continue to make their purchases in euro or in British pound or United States dollar. Lesson number four, Hayek brings to our attention what Karl Menger, the founding father of the Austrian school, had pointed out already in his book, Principles of Economics from 1871, namely that money is a free market phenomenon. Money emerged spontaneously from the free market and out of a commodity. So we, at a theoretical level, we have good arguments to think that a free market in money really could take off. I hope I could give you an overview about uh, what Hayek put in his book, Denationalization of Money. I hope you get an idea why he came up with his proposal. And I hope you also realize that a free market money is possible, that it is economically and ethically really a superior arrangement for our monetary affairs. That is something Hayek has thought about. And I think these ideas are applicable to the current setting we find in this world. And uh, yes, there are lessons uh, to be learned from Hayek's book. So I hope I could achieve my objectives in getting you into contact with Hayek's idea. Have an interest in taking the book at the library and have a read. And thank you very much for your attention and patience. Okay.